Hi guys, Grand J here and welcome to another one of our deck tutorials. So today's video we'll be talking about our latest win deck, Sow the Seeds. So in this video we'll be talking about the overall strategy, how you play the deck, combos, matchups, metagame changes and like some frequently asked questions as well. So let's get started. Before we get started, this is a part two video. So this is the deck tutorial where we go in depth on playing the strategy and really sort of like sort of determine how to best handle certain matchups. If you guys haven't watched the first part of the video, then definitely should check it out first. There's a link in the description below where we sort of go into the deck and sort of explain generally why cards are in the deck. So I do recommend you guys check that out if you're sort of a more beginner intermediate player. Um, we won't be going too much into what the cards specifically do in this video. So yeah, if you guys aren't completely familiar with the cards, then yeah, definitely check that out first. Next thing, because a lot of the cards are quite long, um, we're going to shorten three of the names, the names of three cards. So um, there's the, the main uh, the main trio, which is Kani Senna, Raya O Senna, and Arun Senna. The Senna, we kind of don't really need to say, so I'm just shortening them down to Kani, Raya O, and Arun. So Kani Senna is the forward, Raya O is the, the, the backup that buffs them, and Arun is the searcher. So let's get started. So the general strategy of the deck is to accelerate to five backups as soon as possible because we have cards, uh, Kani uh, and Bats that both really sort of incentivize you to get up to that five back backups as soon as possible. We use unchosable forwards to like deal with uh, opponent's aggression to slow their aggression down, as well as using them as offensive cards later on in the game. We also use searchers and moogles cards to cycle free deck and help you set up. So it's really consistent in that regard. And we play Bats and Senna for free um, towards the end of the game. Um, and then we basically repeat until our opponent just can't really deal with free 9Ks anymore. So in terms of opening hands and mulligans, the ideal the ideal hands that you want to sort of keep are any hand with Arun because Arun Senna is a backup that can search for the, uh, the other backup. So it can search for uh, Raya O or it can also search up for your caddy as well. So it's effectively two backups built in one. And yeah, um, and because we're building a, a deck or a strategy that we really want to get backups down, it's, it's a card that single-handedly gets us um, the conditions that we need to play canny and also gives us uh, an additional backup to play. Ideal, um, uh, additionally, if we have any sort of hand where we have two backups as well, that's also a keepable hand. So yeah, in any hand where we have two backups and we can play two backups down, then that's pretty good. Do mulligan any hands where you have two or more bots or cannies because they are going, they are cards that we want to have later in the game. And if we pitch them early on to play cards, then we're really sort of diminishing our deck's overall power. So yeah, we want to try to mulligan these cards away, try to get them to the, at the bottom of the deck so we can draw them uh, later in the game. And pretty much any other hands where we don't have like an Arun or two backups, we want to mull mulligan these hands because uh, we, we really want to have that sort of early backup start. In terms of opening plays, um, going first or going first or second really sort of depends against your matchup. So if you um, if you're against an aggressive deck, you generally want to take first, and against uh, slower or more control based decks, going second is a little bit better because going first you want to you want to be able to play some cards first because your opponent's going to be more aggressive, so your opponent's going to have like a sort of more a tendency to play faster. So you want to get the sort of edge against your opponent to get that sort of time advantage and to be able to get one one or two of your backups uh, earlier. Against uh, slower decks, um, we take second because we do have that time and do have that space to play um, play more cards before our opponent's gonna play aggressively against us. And having that extra card on your first turn gives you more options in terms of determining what backups you play early on. and also gives you an extra card to discard if you do want to go for that two backup early start. So yeah, um, yeah, focus on sort of like really efficient backup building and depending, uh, and depending on your opening hand, um, and your first draw, this is really what determines what, what our opening plays are. So if you have three even costed backups in your opening hand, you want to play two backups on turn one. So uh, so in this regard, uh, this the reason why we do this is because if we get two backups on turn one, we, it allows us to play the third backup on the second turn for free, or in the case of Maria, for only one discard. So basically we set up two backups. Next turn we use those two backups to play a third backup and we're already like really, really quite high there. Um, in this regard, Arun Santa kind of counts as two backups because it searched for itself and then you can you usually use it to uh, search for Raya Oro as well. So you can get both those two cost backups down on your first turn and then turn two, you can usually follow up with like a Maria or a White Mage, something um, that gets you up to the third backup and it's an even cost of backup. If you have an opening hand in your in your opening, uh, if you have an evoker in your opening hand, um, we generally want to play one backup on turn one. Um, and even though we might have three backups in hand, um, it's better to play one backup on turn one because um, we we're going to be discarding two cards to play two backups within our first two turns. So 
whether we do that turn one, turn two, doesn't really matter if we have an evoker. So it's better to it's better to only discard one card and play one uh, two CP backup on your first turn. On your second turn, you can then tap that one backup to play an evoker and then discard a card to play your, your second backup. The reason why we do this is because it gives us more options in determining which cards we want to discard. So sometimes if you do sort of commit to um, discarding two cards and playing two backups on your first turn, it, you might find that you're on your second turn, you would have had certain cards that you would have preferred to discard. So um, yeah, it just allows us to um, determine which cards we want to discard one turn later. Um, and yeah, if you don't have a sort of an ideal setup like this, just play one backup on your first turn and then move on. Um, when you play Arun Senna in this game, um, in general, so you want to search for Raya O if you don't already have one in hand. Um, yeah, this is because obviously we want to have both, uh, both the backup centers down, um, in order to trigger off Candy Senna's abilities when you do play her. If you, if you do have a Raya O in hand, then you basically want to thin out your deck. So you typically search for, uh, Arun if you do. Um, and this is like, uh, towards, uh, this is like opening plays as well. So we generally don't want to search for Candy, uh, Candy Senna in our opening plays with our own center because we don't want to have this card in hand early game because we're going to be discarding a lot of cards towards early game and having Kani in hand means that we're more tempted to discard her or we're going to require some cards to discard at the at the side of the game and we really don't want to discard her. So typically you use our own center, put it to hand and then fins out your deck, which means you're going to have a great chance for drawing Kani centers, but also you can like pitch um, our spare our own from your hand and it doesn't really matter. The, the reason why we pick, uh, pick up extra Iron Centers uh, to our hand is because they don't, um, they're a card that your opponent's really not going to target. So your opponent's really not going to break this backup. In general, they're really going to target Raya O because Raya O is the backup that actually provides ongoing uh, ongoing buffs to your Candy Center. So yeah, no one's really going to, no one's really going to target your Raya O. So search for Iron Center if you have a Raya O in hand already. And yeah, play uh, search for County Center. Obviously, if Iron Center is your fourth or fifth backup, because it means you're much much closer to actually playing it. So yeah, in that sort of situation, that's when you search for County. In the worst case scenarios where you have zero backups in hand, this is not a it's not an ideal situation, but we can sort of move forward from that. So you want to play forward at least because you obviously have cards in hand. So you need to make plays in your in your first uh, first or second turn. So in that regard, if you have zero backups, it's not a terrible situation. We can move forward from this. So in general, you want to be playing a Moogle if you have it in hand because this is a card that will help us cycle. So if we don't have the backup, if we play a Moogle, potentially we might draw into one. And yeah, it's it's a body to block with. If you don't have that, playing a Balfour or a Trainex is pretty good because they're four CP forward, so you can play them. They're an AK body and they're going to sit there um, to sort of defend against your opponent's aggression. And there's something uh, something that's actually going to be a little bit difficult for your opponent to target. Balfour can't be chosen by abilities when he's when he's active. And uh, sorry. Trey can't be targeted by abilities when he's active, and Balfour um, gives both defensive and offensive plays in the sense that on following turns, if you attack with Balfour, you can always put backups down to reactivate him. So he does. Uh, he so he does have like plays or relevance early on in the game. If you ha don't happen to have one of those three cards, then playing a Ranger down is, is fine, or playing a Dorgan down is as like sort of your worst case scenario. And if you can't do any of that, or you can't get a backup down you actually kind of just roll over and cry. Everything else is kind of a bad play and you just feel bad playing it. Um, not to say that you just scoop up the game, but in a situation where you literally don't have any of those cards, it's actually a pretty bad situation. So moving on to early game plays, like you really want to prioritize backups or building backups until you have at least three backups um, because this allows you to play uh, your uh, four costs, four CP uh, forwards by only discarding one card or allows you to play your three CP backups um, for free as well. Um, additionally, it also um, allows you to play um, your five cost forwards for only one discard, so that's pretty good as well. The only time when you prioritize playing forwards over getting up to your free backups is when your opponent like opens their first turn with two forwards. So certain decks will try to do this. Um, typically, they're very aggressive decks or they're going to be earth decks, right? So in a situation where this occurs, this is the pretty much only time where you want to prioritize playing some def uh, playing some forwards in the early game. Basically when your opponent puts like a big amount of like offensive pressure on you. Um, so in this situation, you usually play like a Trey or a Ranger or a Balfier because they're going to be forwards that aren't usable by your opponent's abilities, which makes them like very good, uh, very good as blockers um, and makes them sort of invulnerable to a lot of sort of follow up abilities. So a lot of times Earth decks will start off with like Yang Ursula or Vincent Yuffie. And then if you play a forward, they will then generally follow that up with a Raoban, takes out your forward, and then just continues to like stampede through. So if you play a Ranger or a Trey, then your opponent can't use uh, can't use uh, Raoban to sort of follow through. 
And yeah, it's just like a defensive, uh, defensive like four they can play. Additionally, if your opponent's playing lightning, there's a lot of stuff that your opponent can't do that they would normally do to get through it as well. So yeah, Trail Ranger, like play it early on if your opponent is attacking you with aggressive forwards. Um, yeah, so if you don't sort of have those backups, then you can always play Moogle. So um, yeah, if you have two, if you have two backups on the field, playing Moogle is actually really good. You can discard a card, put it down, and it helps you cycle through cards in your deck, get more cards, get those backups down, and allow you to sort of continue to make plays. Towards the mid game, this is where we have like a lot more resource to play with, and now we can start like applying some pressure to the board. So yeah, so you want to play forwards that are sort of uh, relevant to matchup. In a lot of cases, they're going to be forwards that are unchooseable by opponent's ability. So your opponent doesn't really have a way to sort of crush down or press down the forwards that you are putting out there to pressure your opponent. Um, and when, while your opponent is trying to like sort of play cards to sort of um, counter your plays, which not many decks will have too many of, um, this gives you an opportunity to sort of build more backups while they're trying to deal with forwards. Um, or this allows you to play stuff like Moogles and that sort of stuff to um, to sort of draw additional cards. So basically, you build some certain amount of backups and you can play uh, a couple of forwards that are sort of going to push your opponent um, or like sort of give you some defensive ability and this gives you the space you need to complete your five backups. So um, in the mid game, when the board is sort of even or under control, this is where you can sort of like finish up your backup line. So it's quite easy to sort of like um, control your opponent's board because unless your opponent's playing a lot of big guys really quickly, you're generally going to be able to brick wall or stall a lot of their smaller forwards. Um, and yeah, so your opponent's not going to be able to push through that much damage towards the mid game. This will give you the time to like play some of your bigger, uh, bigger backups such as Maria, such as Aerith. And these are going to allow you to sort of like, um, more solidify your board situation and allows you to sort of like ramp up to your five backups. And the, the, the quicker we get up to that five backup point, we can, it means the quicker we can sort of start playing Bart and Cannies. Um, in regards to your backups, we the, the sort of backup line we, just, we want to end up with is one copy of Raya O, a Ra Arun, an Aerith, a Maria, and then one other backup. So this is typically going to be a Evoker, but uh, having a White Mage down is also relevant. Don't play more than one Evoker. So if you are in a situation where, um, where you do play more than one Evoker, it eats into the space that you have to play your other backups. So like you are locked out of playing like one error for Maria, if you do put an extra Evoker down. So the reason uh, why um, you only play one Evoker is because you don't want to be in a situation where you're, you're, where you're unable to play your other backups. Um, it is, it, you are allowed to play White Mage early on, even though you haven't completed the set, because you can always use White Mage pretty much at any point to break it, use its ability, and then that creates a space for you to play like an error for Maria to finish up your backup line. Um, okay, so next is, yeah, also during the mid game when you have free backups, it's 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 okay to play Canny or Bart, um, even though you generally like don't want to do it more than once or twice in the game because you are discarding card and you're not sort of getting the the same value back. So um, it does cost you more and you're not getting the the to reactivate as many backups. So you generally don't want to do it too often, but sometimes in a situation where you don't have a good defensive player against your opponent, you can play it down, reactivate your backups, and then that gives you the, the CP to play more backups. So um, something that we'll talk about later on are some of the combos that you can play with this. But yeah, sometimes it's, it is okay to play this in the mid game, especially against more aggressive decks where your opponents burnt a lot of cards from their hand in order to commit forward to the board, but don't have a good backup line. So you just want to put something down to sort of slow down or stall your opponent to allow you to build back up your resource base. Towards the late game, this is where your deck really shines. Um, so you're able to play consecutive free 9Ks um, that are hard to deal with. So you do have Barton, you do have uh, Cannies. So these are both uh, five cost 9Ks, but they're, they're free because our deck is able to play them um, with five CP and it reactivates all our backups. So it's a really difficult deck for your opponent to deal with because your opponent will spend a whole lot of resource trying to deal with these forwards, but then you, can play, you get to play another one for free. There's been so many times where I've had opponents who've spent a whole lot of resources to deal with a Canny Center or to deal with a Bart, only for me to play another one for free in the next turn, and they, they can't really do much with it. Um, and yeah, there've been plenty of times where like the, the board has been like stalemated, like your opponent's got a couple of small forwards, you've got like one or two small forwards, and then you sort of like really, you really push through. As soon as you get that, that fist, fist backup stage, you can just go, Canny Center, Bart, and then like Balfier, or Canny Center, Bart, Trey. So you get to play like 14 CP worth of forwards without discarding a single card from your hand, and you get a lot of uh, a lot of guys and a lot of board pressure to um, deal with your opponents like forwards or yeah, to apply pressure to your opponent. So yeah, this is where our deck really sort of shines towards the late game. Um, we the reason why the deck runs Alexander's is because we, our deck um, has a lot of really strong high level uh, forwards. So we basically want to be in a situation where we can basically destroy our opponents in nine Ks. So we have three nine Ks, but we want to play uh, play summons that destroy our opponents nine Ks. And because of a lot of our forwards can't be uh, chosen by abilities, it means that 
They can generally only fight us or use summons. And so, yeah, so we basically use Ale Alexander to destroy our opponent's forwards that are bigger than us. And then like their, their abilities don't really sort of affect our big forwards as well. Um, another thing that's sort of very relevant for this deck is Diabolos because we are we are sort of really focusing on getting to five backup stage. Diabolos is generally like never, it's almost never going to be less than 5k damage towards the mid late game. And because we're able to play Senna and Bards for free, um, there's almost no situation after you have five backups where you just don't have those two guys. So pretty much in the late game, Diabolus is always going to be hitting for a less, at least 7k. And most of the time you're going to have a forward down with those two as well. So that's usually 8k and we're able to play a lot of forwards very quickly. So yeah, 8k, 9k, it's very easy to hit a very large number with Diabolus as well. And we generally hold Diabolus for forwards that don't reach that 9k mark, but are, are kind of annoying to deal with. Vayne is kind of like the, the most annoying one. Um, because it does lock down our like 5k forwards and because we play a lot we're going to have to destroy Vayne quite regularly. Emperor, um, even th like even though Emperor doesn't really sort of affect our deck all too much because we are playing in a more of aggressive body type build, um, not so much an ability type build, so Dablos does get rid of him as well, even though like we're not too worried if he does stay on the field because it doesn't affect too many of our abilities. Uh, other cards that are relevant are Sabin, Beatrix. These are all like cards that are like quite strong and don't really sort of reach that 9k mark. Um, and yeah, Dablos gives us the option to blow them up as well. Um, obviously it synergizes with Trey because he is a, he is a class zero cadet and also it's an EX bro. So sometimes you will get like free, free, um, damage on your opponent, um, on your opponent's forwards when you hit as an EX bro. In regards to late game plays, you don't want to make it easy um, to trade for your point to trade against your nine case, but it's fine when a big priority target does. So, um, <clears throat> so in this in this situation, you have six like free nine case in decks. So you have free bots and free county centers. So um, it it is uh, it is okay for you to trade your forwards into their forwards because you can play another one for free because your opponent's going to spend a lot more resources putting them down than it, than it costs for you to put them down. So it is okay for you to take trades, but you generally you don't want to make it easy on your opponent. So you want to generally only take trades against your opponent when like it's a good priority target for your opponent to be blocking with and then you're trading basically a free resource on your behalf to deal with one of their more more difficult to like deal with forwards so um stuff like um emperor zan from uh emperor zan from forwards uh from fire is something that like i tend to trade a lot into um because yeah if i have a bots in the center i'll attack with bots and then he'll trade with the the emperor zan and emperor zan isn't able to like shoot the 9k damage on the canning center because it's untruthful by uh by ability so um in that situation trading gets your opponent's forwards actually like, pretty good um it's much more difficult for your opponent to play uh, their forwards down and yeah um, a lot of cases we then then follow up in the main phase two by playing another free bar to your opponent has to deal with another 9k and yeah it's much more difficult for your opponent to play responses in regards to your forwards especially when your forwards are free next moving on to specific play so this is where we talk more about um the particular card combinations and what we can do to sort of like get maximum value out of them so barbarisha is a card that you'll see a lot of in most wind decks now it's absolutely a fantastic card that's why we're running free of it and like against win you you obviously always have to assume that your opponent's playing 3ds so obviously this card can be comboed with balfier or yashtola so basically yeah you play it you make one of your opponent's forwards 1000 power you then use balfier or yashtola to ping them and finish them off um so obviously it can be used for like just straight up removal if you have certain forwards um, but then again, it's also a fantastic card for sort of um, playing aggressively. So if your opponent does have larger forwards, you can attack with cards like Moogle, you can tackle cards like Hope, and if your opponent does block them, um, you can always play Barbarisha in the second main phase to finish them off. So because forwards retain damage, um, playing a Barbarisha to reduce the power means that the, the, the damage still sits on the forward, but then the power is reduced to 1000, which means that they die, they end up dying from this ability anyway. So um yeah, there'll be plenty of times where your opponent can have a really strong or a really powerful or um, a really relevant blocker, and you can just attack with your forwards, and then your opponent has to consider, oh yeah, if they do block your forwards or not, whether you can follow up with a Barbarisha. Um, and when your opponent's in this sort of mentality, you can like bluff, bluff a lot of attacks. So there are certain situations where you can attack with something like Moogle, um, and you don't really mind if your Moogle trades gets it forward because you're drawing a card from it. So yeah, you trade like you trade your Moogle in for their forward, you use Barbarisha to finish it off, and your opponent just like kind of realizes, oh yeah, they probably shouldn't have blocked your Moogle. And you can do this so many times during the game as well. So um yeah, this this card's really strong and it has a strong sort of um sort of has a strong uh mental game to it as well. Uh I suppose uh also it, it can be played during main phase one. So you can play it during uh, the first main phase uh of your turn if your opponent is at a high amount of damage if they're like five or six damage then you can always play it in your main phase one push one of your opponent's forwards 
from whatever power to 1000 and then basically allows you to attack uh, attack through and because they're in a situation where they're on high amount of damage they're going to have to block you forward so yeah so it can be used aggressively as well if you're reaching that sort of end game stage of the game next is balfier so balfier is like uh, is another forward that we use to sort of defend uh, defend against like aggressive um aggressive strategies um although tip uh, because he doesn't have the same sort of um, defensive abilities that Trey or Ranger might have. Um, he is kind of a low, a, like a lower priority play when we are playing against more aggressive strategies. Balfier is good is that in that he does have the ability to trade against larger forwards. So if he is sitting there even at 8,000 power, if a 9,000, 10,000 power forward attacks into him, he can always block it and use its ability to deal 2,000 damage and then finish it off. So he can be used to trade, trade against large forwards. Um, and this obviously combos very well with his S ability. So if he blocks, then um, deals 2,000 damage to a forward. Um, he can then use his S ability to give him first strike to allow him to sort of like um, destroy the opposing forward that's attacking into him and without dying as well. So that's it's it's really good ability to allow him to deal with like uh, larger forwards. Um, additionally, he can also be yeah. Obviously, we know that he can be used to um, combo with Barbarisha, basically allow him to like sort of remove out a forward. Um, if you do play him early, so we, we as we spoke about earlier in the video, if you don't have backups to play, playing him early is also pretty good because you can also um, you can attack with him and then you can use your backups to reactivate him as well. So um, because this deck plays a lot of backups and we're really sort of focusing on that strategy, playing Balfour towards the like mid early game means that we can generally attack with him and then our opponent, um, if our opponent doesn't block with him, uh, doesn't block him, we can then use backups um, afterwards in main phase two to reactivate him and use him for defense as well. Um, yeah. Not to mention he's also pretty good against like sort of weenie type strategies. So one of the forwards that this deck, uh, one of the forwards that this deck kind of like struggles to deal with is um, a, a class zero cadet called Seven, which is four thousand power. Um, so yeah, you can combo this card to allow him to destroy certain like four thousand power forwards or five thousand power forwards um, by like using him to like deal two thousand damage, playing a backup, reactivating, and then shooting again. So um, this card does have some creative plays with him, um, and yeah, it's it's a fun card to sort of combo into all of this. Next, we have Trey slash Ranger. So these two cards have sort of two main uses. So first of all, they're really good walls against aggro um, because yeah, they can't be chosen by your opponent's abilities. And that actually shuts off a lot of like abilities that a lot of the aggressive decks play. So um, against sort of, uh, against a lot of decks, you have like, it does they can't be chosen by Alcid, they can't be chosen by Armand's. Um, Lightning's playing Dragons now. They can't be chosen by Tom Breeze, Genesis, Vivi, and so on. So these are forwards that are really, really quite good in sort of like uh, defending against the meta because um, in those strategies, they're going to be playing a small forward aggressively early on. Then you play a forward to sort of defend or block against that. And then, yeah, usually your opponent will then like counter by playing a Genesis or an Armon or something that either dulls your forward or destroys it completely. And Ranger and Trade can't be uh, chosen by those sort of abilities. So they're actually going to wall off your opponent's forwards. Um, additionally, fire decks, for example, sometimes they'll attack with a forward and then they'll follow up with another forward that can like ping it and ping your forward and finish it off. And this, these forwards also sort of close off those strategies as well. So they're really good to sort of defend against your opponent's uh, abilities early on. Um, in the mid to late game, if we do have a Maria down, they're actually very strong attacks as well because Ranger's on curve and Trade's on curve. So they're all like, um, they're all on curve sides, but then like after Maria comes down, Ranger becomes an AK and uh, Trey becomes a 9K. And now you've got these, uh, you've got these forwards that are above curve and they also can't be chosen by ability. So it makes it very, very difficult for your opponent to try to deal with your forwards. Um, so yeah, so they do have their use early game as well, but in the, the late game, they become like really hard to like deal with forwards. Um, additionally, Ranger is also non-unique. So it is, uh, it is a forward that can have multiple copies on the field at the same time. So in certain strategies, um, in the late game, um, when you have a lot of cards in hand, you can play multiple copies of them. And if your opponent doesn't have any sort of um, like cards that sort of uh, deal with like AOE field control, such as like a Shantoto, then you can just play as many ranges as you want and you're able to sort of defend against your opponent's aggression. Um, this is really handy against fire decks because fire has a lot of ways to um, either deal with your forwards or to like make your forwards unable to block. So if you play a whole bunch of ranges down, your opponent won't have enough Bahamuts and removal to deal with all your rangers, so you're generally going to be quite safe if you're like spamming all these guys out. Um, and yeah. Next is Yashtola. So this card is probably one of the more difficult cards to play um, because uh, early uh, early on and, and late game, Yashtola provides a very sort of a very different like a uh, very different uh, set of abilities. So Yashtola is obviously a much stronger card in the late game because of its first ability, where you can pay one win to deal a thousand damage to forwards. Um, so basically towards the late game, because we have five backups, we can use its ability to just like straight up deal 5,000 damage to our opponent's forwards. Um, and this has like, 
relevant in two ways. So first of all, it allows our mid game forwards to like, so our mid sized forwards to deal with our opponents, larger forwards and trade into them. So if your opponent's playing nine Ks and stuff, we can stuff, send stuff like Rangers into them. And yeah, if they, if they block them, then we, you can use your stall to finish them off. Um, additionally, towards, um, in the late game, we can also use your stall's ability to just basically kill five Ks. Um, if your stall has been around for a whole turn, she can use her dull ability to deal 2000 damage as well. So that means you can spend like all your resources like all your backups and then like dull her to do 7k to forwards, which is basically destroy your opponent's mid-range forwards. And considering how we're able to play Bards and Canna, uh, Canny, they reactivate all our backups. So like we can play like five cost 9Ks and then we still have backups available for your stroller to like sort of uh, play offensive power as well. So this card uh, in this deck allows us to both have removal as well as play aggressive forwards at the same time. Um, yeah, in the early game, like you generally want to pitch it because in the early game, she's generally not too good. Um, but in certain matchups, especially in a more aggressive matchups, then this card can be quite valuable as well. Um, so yeah, so in, unless you're playing against a like very aggro, like weenie type strategy in the early game, you generally pitch it because you generally, um, it's going to be a much, much longer time for her to be relevant or valuable. Um, so yeah, so it's generally not worth pit, uh, holding on to her in early game. Next we have Dorgan. So Dorgan is obviously used as removal. Um, but this card I feel is, uh, like, again, like a very difficult card to play in the sense that, um, how greedy you get with this card determines like how, how, like how good this card is. Um, so yeah, so yeah, obviously Dorgan, Dorgan allows you to remove him to remove one of your opponent's forwards from the game. So obviously any sort of situation where your opponent has a really strong, um, enter break zone ability, Dorgan's a great counter to that. Um, Dorgan's also great, um, defensively as well, because you can block an attack. And before the damage resolves, you can then remove him to remove one of your opponent's uh, other forwards from the game, which basically allows him to deal with two attackers on the same turn. Um, so yeah, that's that's a great thing about him as well. But the hard part about him is how not to get greedy with this. So um, generally, if you do play him, your opponent's going to target him straight away. And if your opponent does have a removal ability to deal with him straight away, then yeah, he's going to die and he's not going to be able to use his ability. But if your opponent does have removal for him, then this, then like as soon as it, it comes around to your turn, Dorgan's uh, fret becomes active, which means that you can like at any point remove from the game to remove one of your opponent's forwards from the game. Now, obviously you can get kind of greedy by kind of sitting him there and then like waiting for your opponent to like play like a more relevant fret than using Dorgan. Um, but you have to consider what plays your opponent can sort of follow up with that you can't respond to. So um, the two main things that wreck Dorgans before you use their abilities uh, the Emperor. So if you have a Dorgan on the field and you're sort of waiting to block one of your opponent's attacks and then remove Dorgan to like remove one of your opponent's forwards, um, if your opponent during the main phase one just plays down the Emperor, all of a sudden your Dorgan gets shut down. So you can't use its ability. And then if your opponent then follows up with removal, Dorgan gets no value whatsoever. So you have to determine um, in the matchup whether your opponent's likely to play Emperor. Um, now, Right now, like there's a lot of emperors uh, in the in the game, so um, most of the time you will be trying to use Dorgan more proactively than reactively because if your opponent puts an emperor down, then all of a sudden it shuts down Dorgan. So that's something to consider. Um, another thing to consider are EX bursts. So like again, if you if you're playing against like something like Fire, which has a lot of EX bursts, such as like Brynhild and all that sort of stuff, a lot of them can hit Dorgan. Um, so yeah, so in those situations where you are like playing aggressively. Um, and you do have forwards and you're attacking them and you have a Dorgan available, sometimes it's better to just use Dorgan, remove one of your opponent's forwards, and then attack with your other forwards, because if you if your opponent does hit an EX burst, maybe something that dulls and freezes him, or something that deals damage to him, then you sort of don't get the value out of your Dorgan as well. So, um, it like, how greedy you get with Dorgan determines how um, effective he is. Now, um, yeah, so you have to determine what sort of EX burst you're sort of, like, going to potentially run into, and, like, the chance your opponent's going to, going to play Emperor. If you're Certain decks won't play Emperor because they're going to be playing other cards instead. So, for example, if you're playing against a Water deck, um, very likely they're going to be playing Light today. So, in that sort of situation, you kind of don't have to worry about the Emperor. But, um, like, in decks right now, like, especially in Ice and Lightning, we're seeing a lot of Emperors. So, in those sort of situations, um, if there's a good target on field, just, like, call it, use Dolgan, blow up their guy, and just, like, kind of, um, sort of don't, um, don't risk him being shut down. <clears throat> Next is Hope. So Hope is one of these cards that sort of like is kind of underrated. Um, so there's a couple of reasons why you're running Hope. So yeah, obviously it's used to search for Alexander. Um, and because there's so many different Alexanders, we, there's like three different Alexanders in the deck. Um, it allows us to find the relevant summon 
um, depending on the situation. So if your opponent's playing a more monster heavy strategy, then it allows us to search for the two CP, uh, two, two CP variant that can destroy monsters. Um, if your opponent's running like five CP forwards, it allows us to search for a four, a four cost copy. Or if your opponent has a bigger big forwards, then you're able to search for the five costs. So um, it, it does have a lot of variable relevance with uh, with this card. Um, the, the fact that it's EX Express is also quite handy as well. Um, so yeah, there will be times where your opponent attacks you, you hit the EX Express and you just get a free Alexander for free. Um, against some more aggressive strategies, it allows you to attack with Bards or Canny Center. Um, and the reason why this is relevant is because aggressive decks will generally put a lot of damage on you in the early game. And even though you do get a board in the later, in the later game, you kind of... Uh, you kind of have to be worried when you're attacking because even if you have, say, three or four forwards on the field, if you're attacking with one or two of them, there might be the potential for your opponent to play a summon like uh, like two cost Shiva to dole two of your forwards or play a, like a Raiden or a Bahamut or something that um, that, may, to, that removes two of your forwards and your opponent just attacks in with two or three guys and you lose the game. Um, so Hope actually is uh, a way that allows you to attack more aggressively with Bats and Senna. Um, and hope is always there to reactivate them on defense as well. So um, it's a good it's a good card to hedge against aggressive plays. Um, obviously, against aggressive decks, you can play it. You can play it early as just like a five thousand power forward, um, and you just reactivate any of the guys that uh, happen to get locked, uh, dulled, or like frozen down. So um, it's a pretty good card in that regard. Um, a lot of people compared uh, uh, compared it to Terra, the four cost light Terra. Um, but like the reason why we're playing Hope is to sort of hedge against aggressive decks. Um, against aggressive decks, a light Terra. Is difficult to play because, um, well, so she so she locks us into playing her because we can't discard her if we want to make other relevant plays, and also she's not EX burst, which aggressive decks are obviously going to be playing more of. And towards the late game, Hope's ability to reactivate your forwards is like uh, is more relevant um, to allow your Canny Center and your Bart to attack. So next we have Erif. So Erif allows you obviously um, to easily ramp from three backups. To more backups because she is a backup that is effectively free while you have free backups on the field um yeah so it's a fantastic card towards late game because of her s ability planet protector which protects your guys from some of the abilities that choose them um there are some great combos with this card in that like um because like i said earlier in the video it is okay to play bots or cami um, when you have uh free backups because you can play them for one uh, for one discard the great thing about Aerith is that you can play Aerith, um when you have free backups she comes in dull uh, but she doesn't keep you. Uh, yeah, she comes in dull, reactivates your other free backups. You can then play a Bart or a Canny Center, um, and then it reactivates Aerith as well. So effectively, you've got four four CPU you're working with. So there have been plenty of times where I've had like free backups in the field. Um, I play Aerith for free, play Bart, reactivate four, and then spend all four to put a Maria down. So in one turn, I was able to get like two extra backups, one of them being Maria and a Bart on the field at the same turn, or like with very minimal discard. So um, yeah, so she's great in that regard. So anytime we can reactivate backups. Um, she can yeah, effectively like can be, have an immediate effect straight away. Um, because a lot of our forwards also have the ability to not be chosen by uh, abilities, um, Aerith gives our forwards even more protection in terms of summons. Um, so yeah, so there'll be a lot of times where your opponent can't use their abilities to get over some of our big forwards, stuff like Trace, stuff like Rager, stuff like Caddy Centers. They're generally going to be holding a big, a big summons to deal with them. So stuff that, stuff like Zillira, stuff like Bahamut, stuff like Odin, and, and, and Aerith will allow us to protect our forwards against that. Um, and yeah, I'll be talking more about that in the matchups a little bit later. Um, additionally, it can be used to push damage, um, in the late game against, like, um, against opponents that have small hands or have aggressive fields, because, a lot of these situations in the in the sort of mid late game, both sides have like four, uh, usually have like five or six damage on them, um, and neither deck wants to play aggressively because if you attack, your opponent's going to block, and it's like a very advantageous block to your opponent. And now you've got one of your forwards that is like unable to block, so you're kind of like left in a situation where attacking leaves you open. So um, you can use it to attack with all your good forwards. Your opponent's going to block uh, most of them, and then you can always use Aerith to reactivate your forwards, have them on defense, and have them available to sort of defend against your opponent's aggressive attacks. Next card is Alexander II. So there are some extra uh, there are some extra uses for this. So basically, its main use is to uh, is to destroy monsters. Um, now, obviously, most monsters like that being played are effects that you uh, that they break and they give an immediate effect, such uh, such as goblins, such as adamantois. Um, so yeah, this, this card can't really be used against those cards too effectively because they're going to just respond by using their break ability to get their effect. Um, but Alexander, um, Alexander, when it does hit as an EX burst, you can blow these 
um, blow these monsters up without your opponent being able to respond. So there have been times where my opponents have like a Cleone or my opponent's got like a Adamantoise and like the Alexander hits on an EX burst, you can blow them up and then they can't respond uh, can't respond to that. So that's a um, pretty handy thing about this card. Not to mention like if in matchups where your opponent does have monsters, you can just use it to cycle through your deck. So it is a card that can replace itself, can do something um, even when it's not relevant to like dealing with uh, opponent's monsters. Um, something that it is that is pretty good about this card is that you can use it to bait your opponent into thinking you don't have Planet Protector available. So like, yeah, the, the big summons that really sort of are annoying to deal with are Zalera, Bahamut, and Raiden. Um, they're going to be the summons that like your opponent are going to rely on in order to deal with you forward. Um, and generally, if you keep Aerith open, your opponent has to sort of play around that. So your opponent has to um, gamble around whether you have air open or not. But if you have air of dull, your opponent can assume, oh yeah, he's his air of stull. He can't use the lair, uh, no, so he can use the lair or Bahamut or Raiden safely. And then you use Alexander in response, reactivate your air of, and then you use planet protector. So you can bait your opponent into thinking you can't planet protector when you actually do. So that's a like handy little thing you do with him. Um, not to mention, uh, yeah, so there's, there's going to be plenty of times where you can just sort of like, um, in the mid game where you can cycle with this card, especially if your opponent hits you with, um, uh, if your opponent if your opponent hits you and you hit a Bart's EX burst, it reactivates all your win characters. Um, yeah, at the end of your opponent's turn, you can always just use Alexander to um, cycle for your deck as well. So it's just um, it's like a, a card that you can just like use to cycle, especially when you have free CP at the end of the turn. Now let's talk about matchups. So the first matchup we'll talk about is Fire. Um, in regards to Fire, I think that this is a even too easy sort of matchup. Um, Fire got a lot of great tools this set, um, but, uh, but a lot of them are abilities that choose your forward. So, um, cards, uh, yeah, so cards that are like relevant right now are Legendary Vivi. Legendary Vivi, Vivi is very strong, and you're having forwards that can't be chosen by opponents forward, obviously very good. Um, one of the new tools that Fire got is Shadow. So Shadow, yeah, is that four CP forward, um, that's able to discard cards to deal damage to your forwards. And this combines very well because he's got first strike as well. So um, if you are attacking with like a ranger or a ranger or a, a canny center, he can't use the ability to uh, ping your forward for some amount of damage and then finish him off with first strike. So do note um, that, yeah, any of your forwards that can't be chosen by ability is going to be very, very strong in this matchup. Um, yeah, so your opponent's going to find it very difficult to remove your forwards. Um, they are going to be like using Bahamuts, especially considering that there's a lot more supports for Bahamuts now. Um, so you generally want to hold Aeris for that. Um, try not to use Aeris, um, try not to use Aeris defensively to just reactivate your forwards. You generally want to try to hold it for when you can, your opponent tries to commit to a Bahamut. Um, and yeah, so if your opponent uses a Bahamut and you use Aerith, you basically win the game from there because your opponent's committed like either seven or nine resources, um, into trying to blow up your forwards. You stop that and then like you basically like brick all your opponent for the entire turn. Um, and yeah, you just like kind of push on through there. So try your best to uh, to sort of avoid the temptation of using Aerith early on because they're going to be very good um, to deal with your opponent's like large summons because a lot of the other card effects are just not going to be able to get through. Um, Alexander 4 and 5 are both very good in this matchup. Um, the reason is because, yeah, there's quite a couple of good 5s right now, especially uh, in Fire. Um, we've got um, Edgar, which is a card that searches for Sabin, and Sabin's a card that's very popular at the moment, um, as well as Emperor Zan. So a lot of Fire cards are going to be running uh, a couple of 5 cost forwards, so it's a good way to deal with them. Um, Fire also has a certain uh, has a lot of cards that buff their guys as well. So a lot of them are sitting at the AK mark, but like when they're attacking, they have selfie to buff them. Sabin buffs himself. Um, they also have Belias the Gigas that can give them plus one thousand. So holding Alexander five um, is very good in this situation because your opponent will spend resources trying to buff their guys from eight thousand to nine thousand or eight thousand to ten thousand, and then you can just always use your Alexander blob the forward um, after they sort of commit to that. So Alexander five is good in this matchup, even though. There may not be a target at the moment. Your opponent more often than not will have ways to buff their guys up, and that's why you when, when you sort of capitalize on having your your Alexanders there. Against Ice, um, so this this matchup is reasonably easy as long as you kind of play it smart. Um, so yeah, a lot of their forwards really have no way of dealing with your forwards um, because yeah, a lot of them can't be chosen by ability. So a lot of cards that they rely on, such as Genesis, um, yeah, Genesis uh, and all that, can't really sort of deal with your forwards. Pretty much the only way that they can get through your forwards is by using the two cost Shiva. Um, and yet that's pretty much the only way that your opponent can sort of like deal with your forwards. Um, other, like one other card to sort of keep in mind is Vayne. So Vayne does lock down your five cost forwards. So um, that, that card's going to be very annoying. They're going to be playing quite often, especially because we're almost always going to have Bart's and centers um, in, the, in the late game. So 
yeah, keep Diabolus for them. They don't have a lot of ways to remove our forward, so Diabolus is always going to be hitting for 8 or 9k. So, yeah, it'll be a great way to deal with Vayne. Um, if your opponent is running Duke Larg, um, then Alexander Fight is great as well. Because, yeah, while Duke Larg's on the field, your, your opponent's Vayne is going to be from 8,000 to 9,000. You Alexander it every single time. So there's a lot of tools for us to deal with Vayne, even though Vayne's very good in this matchup. Um, and, yeah, so if your opponent's playing a more discard-orientated version of Ice, um, five backups is how you beat it. So basically... Um, this card decks are strong because if you don't build your backups, if your opponent reduces the cards in your hand, then you sort of like lose steam really quickly. But if you have five backups, you're always able to play cards that you draw on your turn. Um, so yeah, and this card, because this deck is able to play so many backups down early on, it means that like towards the late, mid late game, we're always going to be able to play a lot of cards and your opponent's like discard cards generally aren't very good at combat. Um, and your opponent isn't able to sort of really lock down your forwards using their dull abilities because a lot of them can't be chosen. So yeah, and the most important thing in this matchup to note is keep Aerith and Hope um, available to reactivate your forwards in response to a Zalira. So Zalira hits a lot of very relevant targets in a lot of um, in a lot of matchups. We have we have five cost forwards and we do have a couple of free cost forwards as well. So Zalira is going to be very good in response to them. So always keep um, an Aerith in hand um, to sort of deal with these situations. Do not be tempted to use it when your opponent is going to try to attack you, and in order to Aerith in response to try to block your opponent's forward, because that's when your opponent can capitalize by Zalarying you in response, and then like you lose both the Aerith and your forwards as well. So hold it off to it. Literally do not use Aerith's Planet Protector unless your opponent uses Zalera, because while you have it active, your opponent won't Zalera you, and while, yeah, and while you, if your opponent, whoever uses Zalera or Aerith first in this matchup loses. So if you do it first, you're going to lose. So do not do it unless your opponent plays Zalera. In, in, if your opponent do, does, then you're, you're good. Next is Wind. So Wind is actually surprisingly uh, even to hard matchup. Um, and the reason for this is because of Archers. So um, I've actually yeah, like noticed in testing that Archers are actually really good because Raya O's um, are the two cost backup that makes it so your 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 other centers can't be chosen by abilities. And also it's the, the backup that gives Candy Center plus 2000 power as well. So it is a two cost, it is a two cost backup and itself is able to be chosen by abilities. So archers can hit for a lot of value in this game. So um, not only does it make your canning centers like choosable to, to abilities, but also reduces the power from 9,000 to 7,000. So archers are actually very, very strong against them. In this matchup, you want to keep your Ryo's every single time and keep them spared. Just hold on to them because your opponent's going to spend resources to just blow them up. You got to put another one down immediately. Um, so yeah. So it's really important to hold extra extra copies of them. Do not discard them. Um, if you have uh, if you have Arun centers, use them to search up for spare copies of this. Keep them in hand. Hold them as long as you can because your opponent is definitely going to break them. Um, in addition to this, uh, it's like when when your opponent like when your opponent attacks, generally try to block with your forwards that are unchoosable. So like stuff like Trey, stuff like Ranger, because this matchup is really annoying because your opponent has Barbarisha. So if you don't block with one of those forwards in particular, then yeah, your opponent will be able to use Barbarisha to finish off your forwards as well. So um, do keep that in mind. Um, yeah, in general, we'll try to block with unchoosable forwards because it makes it very difficult for your opponent to like sort of deal with like deal with your forward. So yeah, um, always be careful. Uh, be careful. Uh, be careful and keep track of how many archers your opponents have on field and whether they're active or not. Because one of the worst things to do is to attack with like a canny center and then your opponent uh, your opponent blocks it and then uses like one of the archers to break your Raya O, which then uh, brings your forward from 9,000 to a 7,000 and then the forward is able to easily like beat it out in combat so do keep track of that um, and that this is sort of the reason why this sort of this matchup is quite difficult um, and yeah also be quite um, quite wary of when they block um, block your 9k with a 7k or block your 9k with a 6k um, because um, a lot of Windex especially like Windex that have uh, a rare unit in them run Valifor as well the two cost Valifor that deals 3,000 damage to all your opponents forwards um, in that sort of situation, you do have to keep that in mind. Um, if they block your your candy center with like a 6,000 power forward um, in a situation where they didn't need to, especially if they're on low damage, you have to sort of consider whether they're going to follow up with a Valor 4 or not. Because if you then attack with like a Bart and your opponent blocks with like another 7k like a Barbarisha, um, you might think you've come out ahead because you just killed two of their forwards. But then if they like follow up with a Valor 4, they've taken out two of your 9k's. Um, and they've like traded it with like a Moogle and something else. So um, in this situation, when my opponents put out a block and I think it's really kind of weird, um, especially when they're on low life, um, yeah, be wary of the Valifor because like if they play play a Valifor afterwards, you lose a whole bunch of value from that. Next matchup is Earth. So this is a sort of like easy to even sort of matchup. Um, Earth is generally going to be the aggressor. Um, they, yeah, they have a lot of like 
strong value plays early on. Um, yeah, from their, yeah, sort of, they play a lot of 4-2, so they play, like, Yang Ursula or Vincent Yuffie, and so they're going to have, like, uh, a big, a, a big sort of aggressive start, um, which is a little bit annoying, but, um, our ping effects do allow us to trade into Earth's forwards, um, especially because Earth is a very resource-intensive strategy. Um, if you can deal with their forwards, even though they're quite tough or they have the ability to sort of fight very well, if you can deal with your, your, your opponent's forwards, then they like generally lose a lot of steam very quickly, and they sort of have to rely on Shantotos very very early on to deal with um, your aggression. And like after your opponent Shantotos, generally this is kind of where you win because you can just play like 9-9-8 like a Bart's Candy Center and a Trey or Bart's Candy Center, something immediately after an opponent just basically has no steam to respond to that at all. So basically deal with your first, you deal with your opponent's first aggression, play some forwards, um, win the board to a point where your opponent just like Shantotos you, and that's where you sort of like double down, put everything down, and then your opponent just like kind of loses from there. So that's what this like, uh, uh, what this matchup's all about. Basically deal with your opponent's early defense, uh, like early aggression with your defense, and as soon as you get to that stage, you just kind of apply pressure and you just sort of win. Generally don't try to commit, um, to uh, double double nine Ks until your opponent plays Shantoto. Playing a single Bart's or playing a single canning center is like generally pretty good. Um yeah, so after your opponent like Shantoto's you, then you then you can do it, then like you're you're fine. Um you can sort of like commit to it if like your opponent discards the Shantoto and you put one in damage. So if your opponent like reveals two Shantotos that they can't use, then it's generally pretty safe. Um certain decks, certain players and certain decks will run free copies of it. But generally if you're taking two out, like it's generally a pretty good, pretty good indication that you can just go go ahead. Um Alexander 5 is generally pretty good in this matchup as well because Earth um relies a lot of its ability on yeah, having big forwards. So Alexander will almost always be relevant most of the time. Um and it's very, very good. Uh, it's very good in response against like um, opponents like Raubans or Hecaton cares. So if your opponent wants a situation where they want their fight a forward to fight your forward, you Alexander uh, you use Alexander 5 in response, all of a sudden you've not only destroyed their forward, but you've sort of wasted one of their abilities as well. So yeah, hold on to them because it's gonna be very good in this matchup. In addition, Alexander 2 is also very good in the sense that like uh, uh, quite a few Earth decks are playing Magic Pots as well. And because Magic Pots come into play dull, it means that like they play them and there's going to be one turn where they can't really do anything, which means you can sort of like use Alexander to deal with them straight away. So um, that's another sort of handy thing to know in this matchup. Next is Lightning. And I think that Lightning is probably the easiest matchup of all, simply because it so heavily counters your opponent's strategy. Lightning is all about using forwards and forwards enter, break, uh, enter field abilities to either like deal damage to opponent's forwards or to dull them. And because of a lot of our forwards can't be chosen, your opponent literally, like it literally shuts down like 70% of your opponent's strategy. Um, most of your opponent's forwards literally can't do anything against your forwards. And a lot of them aren't very big either. So you'll win fights and your opponent can't use their abilities. Um, it locks down so many of your forwards. Alcid, Rigdia, Onion Knight, um, Armon. So many cards just straight up locked out. To a point where it's just like your, your forwards just like win win fights, um, and your opponent really can't do much about it. So your opponent is basically going to have to rely on using Raiden to kill you or like to kill your forwards, and this is basically where you this is basically where you use hold Planet Protectors. Do not be tempted to use Planet Protector on any situation other um, other than Raiden or Odin, um, because yeah, uh, it's like your opponent can't deal with your forwards in any other way. Um, if you have a Bart on the field, so. Because like Canning Santa, Ranger, and Trey can't be chosen by your opponent's abilities, when you do play Bart, your opponent is going to like play like an Armon or uh, or an Alcid Onion Knight on him. Do not use your Planet Protector on him. Even though he's one of your forwards that can be chosen by one of those abilities, and you kind of want to protect him, protect him, do not do that because it means you've got you don't have the Aerith in hand anymore and you want to hold it for Raiden. So it's much better to just let your Bart die, and you play a new Bart next turn, then um then to Planet Protect your Bart's, and then some point later down the game, your opponent uses like Raiden to blow up your Bart's and your carrying center and then just like kills you that turn. So avoid the temptation. And so this this is one of those uh, situations where um, knowing the matchup is really, really important and knowing what your opponent's outs are. Your opponent doesn't win if they out and unite your bots because you've got carrying center available to block or you've got ranger or something to block as well. You're, you lose a game when you are at like five damage and your opponent raids your two big guys and just attacks through with the rest of their guys. So um, yeah. And if your opponent raids you, you use plant protector, you just win because your opponent's blowing nine resources to do nothing. If other forwards generally can't do anything either, you just like go in and you win. That's pretty much it. And the final matchup is against Water. So this is probably an even slash hard matchup um, because your opponent has a lot of very varied uh, outs. So there's a lot of ways for them to deal with you in combat um, and they don't involve buffing their own guys necessarily. So they do have stuff like Tom Breeze, they have Choo Choo Lane, 
um, Kagnaz Organa, there are a lot of ways for your opponent to like reduce the power of your guys. If they had cards that were sort of increase the power of their guys, then like it does put them in range of Alexander, but because a lot of their abilities reduce um, reduce your your cards' powers, um, it doesn't put them in line with Alexander. And Garnet, because she can't be chosen by uh, by summons, your like even if your opponent sort of buffs up Garnet, you can't use Alexander to deal with her. So um, a lot of things can't really deal with Garnet, and Garnet makes it very difficult for you for you to fight your opponent. Um, in addition to this. Um, Water also has Minwoo, which is relevant, but like not too severe because we're not putting a lot of our strategy into like the sort of ping effect type strategy. Um, so Minwoo is uh, not going to be so severe against our deck. Um, what is pretty severe is Legendary Cecil um, because yeah, so Legendary Cecil is like a card that yeah, obviously makes it so none of your abilities do any sort of damage to your opponent's forwards and also gives them a plus 1000 pump, which generally puts them at a stage where it's very difficult for you to contest their forwards. Um, in this situation, you want to really hold Alexander. So you want to hold Alexander's, like Alexander's actually quite good for this matchup. Um, and yeah, especially if your opponent's playing Cecil, because that's going to be one of your few ways to deal with it. Um, the reason why Legendary Cecil is seeing a lot more play is because it combos well with the new Legendary Steiner. Um, the new Legendary Steiner allows you to dull one of your own water forwards to give Steiner plus 1,000 power. So um, even though you might have a forward that's bigger than Cecil and your opponent plays a Cecil, if you attack with it, like they can just double the Cecil so the Cecil isn't, um, isn't able to block it. And then like, Blocks it with their legendary, uh, with their legendary Steiner, which will be ten thousand at that point because legendary Steiner is eight thousand power. Cecil gives him plus one thousand power, and then he dulls them to give himself another plus one thousand power. So Cecil and Steiner have a um, have a combination there that like allows you to have Cecil protect Steiner, and then Steiner kind of protects Cecil from combat as well. Um, so it's a really good combo, and that's why we're seeing a lot of Cecil play. Um, so yeah, do keep Alexander's for removing opponents like Cecil, uh, legendary Cecil when they do play them. Something to note, and and this is actually pretty cool. It's what I call the Steiner Cecil paradox, right? So, especially like in a situation where your opponent's like low on life, so like maybe they've taken like five or six damage, um, and you sort of want to push through for game with your forwards, you might be stuck in a situation where your opponent has both a legendary Cecil and a like legendary Steiner on the field, right? Your your immediate response might be, oh yeah, okay, so obviously like. He's going to like he's going to dull his Cecil to make Steiner. Yeah, he's going to dull his Steiner, you know, dull his Cecil to buff his Steiner. Um, so like yeah, when you attack, obviously he's not going to block with Cecil. But what you can do, um, it's called the like the Steiner Cecil paradox. In that if you have a uh, if you have the heroic Alexander or Alexander five, if he has to determine he has to do what he has to do before he determines a block. So if you attack with a, if you attack with one of your forwards that are bigger than Cecil, your opponent has to dull Cecil um, before they declare blocks. And if they dull Cecil, now their Steiner is definitely big enough to die from Alexander. So you can just Alexander the Steiner and all of a sudden they got no blockers, right? So basically there's no way in which Cecil doesn't die or your opponent takes damage. Um, so it's a paradox in that your opponent can't protect both of them, and by protecting one then that leaves the other one uh, vulnerable, and then you can just swing through. So um, do note that if your opponents, uh, if your opponents are low on health, and yeah, they've got Steiner and Cecil, and they try to rely on that, you can just like, attack. If they if they are dumb enough in to dole their Cecil to block with Steiner, you just Alexander before they can block, and then yeah, you just attack through with, with the rest of you guys, and you just win from there. So meta game changes. So depending on your local meta game and what's more like sort of relevant, we can make some changes to the deck to help us sort of handle these sort of things. So if you're seeing a lot of wind, or wind or water in your local meta game, then I would uh, switch out um, two white mages and one one evokers and pr put in free archers. Um, and I would switch out two hopes for two legendary terrors from the set. Um, the reasoning for this is that a white mage and evokers like or like the white mages aren't necessary in like wind or water type matchups. Um, but free archers are very, very good. Like, especially in like wind decks, like I said, archer can like hit them out if they're running the center strategy. Um, yeah, archers are very good against water because a lot of their free, uh, free cost backs are also really good. Um, so it hits out Minwoo, um, it hits out Waka, it hits out like rare Yuna as well. Um, so archer just hits a lot of very good backups right now. And yeah, if your opponent's playing any sort of like Yuna Riku paint strategies, then archer is always a great way to like just, um, deal with your opponent's like backups to break up their combo. Um, the reason why we switch from Hope to Terra is because Hope is um, Hope is better against aggressive strategies because he's both an EX burst and allows you to reactivate. But Terra is something that's a little bit bigger. Um, so yeah, it's also a light card. But against sort of, sort of more slow controlling type strategies, we don't need the flexibility of having a uh, having a win card as opposed to having a light card. So uh, Legendary Terra fits in there. Um, also, Legendary Terra can also 
um, switch for any summon, which is like pretty handy. And Legendary Terra is um, 7,000 as well, which um, a lot of cards um, in Wind and Water also set at that 7,000 7, power mark. So allows your Terra to trade effectively against them. Against more aggressive strategies, I would take out two Yashola and um, two Yashola and put in one Ranger and one Dorgan. So um, obviously this is because Yashola is a very like sort of late game strategy. And if uh, if your local meta game is filled with a lot of aggro, then Yashola is a little bit uh, it's a little bit difficult of a card to sort of like make use in these sort of matchups. Ranger is very good, um, and Dorgan also yeah again allows you to defend and remove, um, and it's a very good like card uh, against aggro early on as well. If your local meta game is full of Ice, Fire, or Lightning then we can really double down on a lot of crazy crap. Um, so in this sort of situation, we can take out one Evoker and take out one White Mage um, and put in two two Aerith. It doesn't really matter whether it's like Legendary Aerith or Common Aerith, but basically we just want to have more Aerith in hand that we can play um, using Planet Protector. Um, yeah, so like I said, in these match in those matchups, your opponent has very few outs because a lot of their strategies built around their, their forwards and their forwards abilities. Um, they have to rely on their summons in order to get over you guys. And if you have like more planet protects, then your opponent just literally can't get over you. Um, yeah. So yeah. So, uh, having additional errors is good. Like it doesn't really matter which error you put in because you don't, you're not going to actually play them down. So don't, so don't actually play these errors. Okay. Do not be tempted to like think, oh yeah, we'll just put down the legendary error. Do not do that. Okay. In these matchups, just hold it. Um, pitch them if you don't have your rare Aerith down. Um, but yeah, they're just extra shots with Planet Protector, and they're going to be so so good in these matchups. Next, frequently asked questions. So I get questions during the week from social media and stuff uh, about people me asking stuff. So here are just a couple of uh, questions I'm going to address. First one is why no 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 Zemus? Oh my god, you do not know how many times I've ugh, I've been asked this question so many times. Um, this deck doesn't either. Okay, so first of all. It's expensive in the sense that, look, our deck, our deck's goal is to get up to five backups as soon as possible, right? So we, so Nono and Zemus are both expensive backups. So Nono is actually like fine, like you can sort of like consider a cheap backup because it gets you more resources, right? Um, but it's it's nothing compared to Aerith, right? Um, and Zemus is just like an expensive backup that doesn't inherently do anything. It makes it so you guys like can't be blocked, but your guys are generally bigger than your opponent's guys anyways, and you, your opponent generally doesn't want to block your guys because you've always got Barbarisha. So your small guys, your opponent doesn't want to block because of Barbarisha, and your big guys are just too big to block anyways, right? So like Zemus is like like kind of unnecessary for this deck, and it's also expensive, right? So if you like consider our backup line, so we, we already have to have like Arun Center and Raya O Center, okay? So what does that leave that what does that leave our backup line that we can sort of replace, right? So it leaves us Aerith, which arguably you can replace Aerith with Nono, right? Um, and you can replace Evoker for Zemus. Okay, so think about that, right? You're you're replacing a one cost backup with a four cost backup. That's three extra CP you have to get in, right? So um, and in addition to that, it's a dark card as well. So you're you're committed to playing it, all right? This deck doesn't have a way to get rid of extra Zemuses. So not only are you committing to playing a more expensive card. You don't have ways to get rid of extra copies of it, and you don't inherently need it. So, you don't want Zemus, plus Emperor is still popular right now, and Emperor just shuts down Zemus, okay? I would much rather play Emperor in this deck before Zemus. Um, so yeah, don't play Zemus, don't play no, no this deck doesn't need it. Next, what happens if they play Legendary Emperor, right? It's not that bad. If you look at this deck, there are only a couple of cards that have like activated abilities, and they're not super core to our strategy, right? If you do need to activate a certain ability, let's say a Dorgan, you just Diablos the Emperor, right? Um, yeah, you have forwards that are bigger than their forwards, right? So most of you guys are eight or nine Ks, so they're going to trade or like be bigger than Emperor, all right? If you attack with those guys, your opponent never wants a block of Emperor, right? I guarantee you, like 90% of the time, unless your opponent's going to die from it, if you attack with a Trey, your opponent won't block it. Uh, block it with Emperor, right? If you have a Maria down and a Ranger, and like let's say you've got an 8,000 uh, 8, power Ranger, your opponent is not going to block your Ranger with Emperor, right? Because in their mind, they think that Emperor is going to win them the game, but it's not. It's a crutch. So you, you attack the guys, and your opponent's literally not going to block with Emperor because it, like Emperor is like the, what they think their win condition is. Literally, it's it's okay. And then it, it literally does nothing against Bart's or Canny Center, right? So Emperor is not terrible against this deck. If you want to remove it, just attack with guys. If your opponent does block with it, um, then yeah, you can use Barbarisha to finish it off if they if it blocked the removal or something. So it's not, it doesn't kill this deck. So you don't have to worry about it all too much. At worst, it makes it so like, at worst, it makes it so your opponent um, forces you to not be able to use Planet Protector. Um, but yeah, that's literally the, the most value that this card brings. So don't worry about it too much. If you are worried about it, just hold Dablos for it. Um, you generally hold Dablos 
like uh, as soon as you get to five backers because yeah if your opponent plays like one of those uh, relevant four cost forwards such as like a yeah such as like a vein such as an emperor you can always dabble it so it's always relevant there so yeah don't worry about it too much have hold a dabble for it and just kill it next question is would you consider minerva so actually this is not quite a terrible card um so yeah so if the metagame is actually not super aggressive um then yeah i can see it like i can see it running one copy of it in the deck to help um over mid-range decks because like if your opponent's playing like sort of mid-range forwards around the 8 or 9k um minerva is actually pretty good so um yeah so you can use it to, like to cycle for cards or you can use it to um increase your points forwards or like, re like or remove your points forwards abilities so um, it's actually a pretty good win condition um and yeah, because we're playing Air uh, R, it does offer some protect. We a we are able to offer some protection to it as well. So um, potentially, so like um, yeah, potentially I might consider trying it out. Might not be a bad card. Um, yeah, give it a shot. And why evokers? Aren't evokers bad? Basically, you really want to get to free backup at the end of, at the end of your second turn. Um, there are only a couple ways to do this. So if if all you have are just two CP backups, right? If all you have are two CP backups, it means you have to discard two uh, two cards to get two two CP backups on turn one, right? Um, and then you tap both of them to put a two CP backup down on your third turn. So basically, you've discarded two cards to get three backups down by your second turn, right? Now, this is quite a like quite a expensive process in the sense that you want you have to get two two CP backups down on your first turn. So you've got to have those two backups and you have to discard two cards from your opening hand, all right? So you have to commit four cards from your opening hand in order to like do this, right? And what happens if in your early in your in your early hand you have certain cards that you sort of don't want to pitch. Let's say if you have Moogles, if you have Diablos, if you have like centers or bars and stuff, you don't want to pitch these cards, right? Um and yeah, being in a situation where if you have two two CP backups, you have to pitch a lot of them, which can affect your late game because oh yeah, I would have won this game because uh, I would have won this game if I had an extra bot, or I would have won this game if I had an extra center. If you had to pitch them early, then that's bad, right? If you have an evoker in hand, um, it allows you to commit only one uh, one discard on your first turn. So you can discard one card, play a 2CP backup on your first turn. On your next turn, you can then tap that for an evoker and then discard a card to play another 2CP backup. You're still discarding the same amount of cards, but you get effectively an extra two cards to determine because you on your second turn, you draw two more cards that you can discard for what your next 2CP backup is. So it allows you to delay discarding cards and determine which cards from your bigger pool to discard from. That's what um, Evoker is sort of like really handy for in this deck. Plus, if you don't believe me or you think I'm bad or whatever, the Japanese do it a lot. And they're pretty good at card games and they've had this card game for a lot. When I went over to Japan for World Championships, every, all the Japanese players played a lot of Evokers. And uh, yeah, sort of like, they have a kind of like a, a sort of, like had they have a very similar like mentality um to this sort of deck get a lot of backups down and then play forwards it works as good um if you don't believe me japanese are doing right doing it right right so yeah and finally to finish off with some final tips um the most important thing i want to talk about in this deck is don't discard your alexanders early because you currently don't have a target okay you might think in a lot of cases oh man it seems like there's not a lot of good targets for alexander five quite often your opponent will play into them Okay, so in a lot of cases, at some point, your opponent's going to play a big forward to try to stop you. Alexander's good there. Um, and like in a lot of decks, your opponent's going to have ways to buff their guys to deal with your forwards. Alexander's a good response. So um, yeah, like I said in like an early part of this video, it's good in a, in a lot of matchups. Um, it, against Wind, if your opponent uses Sylph, it becomes relevant there. Against Fire, if your opponent uses Belize or any sort of way to buff their guys, it becomes relevant there. So yeah, so Alexander is surprisingly more relevant than you may think. So, thanks for watching, guys. Let me know um, if you guys have any feedback or any comments or any questions. Put them down in the comment section below. I do read these and I do try to respond to everyone as much as I can. So, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please do thumbs up and subscribe. It helps with the YouTube algorithm so I can share more content with you guys more regularly. So, that's great. Really appreciate the support. Um, recently, I did start streaming on, on Twitch as well. So, I've been streaming Final Fantasy like trading card game on uh, OCTGN or Octagon. Um, so, I, I streamed that... Like I, I aim to stream that five days a week. Um, here's the local time. So it is Sunday to Thursday. Um, here's your local time. So if you guys want to jump on and watch some games, that's cool. Um, I also do like deck tutorials. Um, so not, not, uh, I do deck fixing. So if you do have a deck idea and you want my opinion on it and get some, like, um, get some ways to improve your deck, I've been doing that as well. I usually do like one, 
like one a day. So if you want to come in and get some advice on your deck, or you want me to play a certain strategy with certain cards, then that's definitely um, yeah, pop into the stream then. There's a lot of very high level games. There's a lot of great players from US and UK on at that time. So if you want to see some high level play and you sort of want to hear my commentary and thoughts, um, that's a great time to pop in. So um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, leave them down in the question section below. Appreciate you guys for watching. Grand J out.